In this video, we're going to look at some uh, pancreatic uh, disorders. So we're going to look at first some functional disorders, functional pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, and then a state of excess, which is not recognized biomedically, but I'm going to say a little bit about that. Uh, pancreatitis, acute and chronic. We'll look at pancreatic cancers, um, and then uh, the endocrine disorders of the pancreas. I'm going to primarily talk about those in relationship to uh, type 1, type 2 diabetes. So that'll be in the diabetes uh, notes. So here's a summary of basic pancreatic disorders. We've already looked at the congenital disorders like annular pancreas, uh, the ectopic pancreas. Uh, pancreatitis would be inflammation of the pancreas, and that can be acute and chronic. We'll, we'll look at that in more detail. Uh, in terms of pancreatic tumors, there's really two types of tissue that can create cancers in the pancreas. Uh, one would be from the exocrine pancreas, and that would be your pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, there's also ductal carcinoma, and then you can form various types of pancreatic cysts. Um, the adenocarcinoma is what most people think about when they say, or mean when they say pancreatic cancer. That's going to be the most common type of pancreatic cancer. However, you can also create tumors from the endocrine cells, and those would be from any of the cells in the islets of Langerhans, the beta cells, the alpha cells, the somatostatin cells, and those are called pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, PNETs, uh, and they're uh, less than 5% of all pancreatic tumors. But the important thing there is that these have usually a better prognosis and there's more treatment options available than the pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, and then one other, which we won't be talking about here, but this would be Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which is basically a gastrinoma uh, that usually occurs in the stomach, but it can also occur in the pancreas. These are cells that secrete gastrin. Remember, gastrin is one of the signals, three signals that parietal cells need to make acid. So this is a parietal cell and uh, secretes hydro hydrogen ions as well as chloride, and that's going to make HCl in the stomach. Um, it needs acetylcholine as a signal. Uh, it needs histamine. And uh, remember, the histamine receptors are the H2 uh, receptors. And then the um, uh, gastrin, which is normally released by gastrin G cells in the antrum of the stomach, um, the portion of the stomach before it enters into the duodenum. Um, so the parietal cell has receptors for all three of these. And when all three are active, it secretes, it releases the acid. So gastrinoma would oversecrete gastrin and we get hyperacidity. So that's one cause of peptic ulcers and whatnot uh, from a gastrinoma. Cystic fibrosis, we also won't discuss here, but that definitely affects the pancreas. Uh, this is a, a genetic disease. There's a defective chloride transporter. And the result of that is thick mucus, uh, uh, sweat, and uh, digestive uh, juices. So basically, the pancreas becomes filled up with this thick mucus. There's enzyme insufficiency, and um, that also can cause fibrosis and cyst formation of the pancreas, leading to pancreatitis. Uh, and because of the enzyme deficiency, there can be malnutrition from that. Uh, type 2 diabetes, we've already talked about that a bit, but that's going to be with insulin. So type 1 would be an absolute lack of insulin, usually due to autoimmune beta cell destruction. Uh, and then type 2 uh, diabetes would be insulin resistance, usually associated with many years of hyperinsulinemia, uh, but this would be a uh, later stage, maybe insulin uh, deficiency. And then exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, EPI, we'll talk about that here next. That would be a lack of digestive enzymes, uh, pancreas does not secrete. This often goes together with gastroparesis. In gastroparesis, the stomach motility is inhibited. So food just seems to, seems to just sort of sit in the stomach. It doesn't go further. Um, and at the same time, the pancreas is not putting out its enzymes. Uh, lots of different disorders like chronic pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis can cause EPI. Uh, the diagnosis would be actually measuring in the feces uh, the presence of elas uh, elastase, fecal elastase, uh, lots of fecal fat, and there are different pancreatic function tests like uh, looking at amylin and lipase would be two enzymes, whether or not they're in the plasma or not. Uh, and the treatment here would be primarily enzyme replacement, but I'll talk about that next with some potential herbal options. Um, so that is sort of the biomedical recognized EPI. We can say there's a more functional EPI, and that would be essentially what I discussed in the last video as what in Chinese medicine is called spleen qi deficiency. Same idea. 
Um, so um, we actually could use that potentially uh, term in terms of coding and so forth. So this is um, kind of an overview of all the different pancreatic disorders. So functional EPI, functional exocrine and pancreatic insufficiency, uh, again, would translate in Chinese medicine as spleen, stomach, chi, or yang deficiency. In Ayurveda, we might say that's lack of agni or digestive fire. Um, and uh, this is not the same as the biomedical EPI, which is really uh, something that happens more in chronic pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis. But we do see this, I do see this pattern frequently in the clinic and patients who are given the appropriate therapy seem to respond quite well uh, to this. So basically we can see this in conditions like gastroesophageal reflux, GERD. Uh, there's really two types of GERD. We can say there's a hot GERD and a cold GERD. Uh, the hot goal GERD would be actually, would have hyperacidity in the stomach um, there'd be more inflammation. People are usually worse with any sort of enzymes, vinegar, spicy foods, that sort of thing. Uh, but the cold GERD is associated with decreased stomach acid secretion and poor lower esophageal sphincter tone together with pancreatic insufficiency. And this is often due to a decreased function in the vagus nerve. And uh, so that's going to be the cold GERD. Uh, there is the, in gastritis, remember there's two types of gastritis. Type A is more of a cold type that's associated with pernicious anemia. You get loss of stomach acid from destruction of parietal cells, loss of intrinsic factor, atrophy of the stomach mucosa, versus type B gastritis, which happens lower down in the stomach. That's uh, more uh, of the hot type. And um, so that would be uh, more inflammatory, more hyper acid and so forth. And then peptic ulcers, same thing. Gastric ulcers are associated with hypochlorhydria. Ga uh, duodenal ulcers are going to have more hyper uh, 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 acid secretion and so forth. So that's more of a hot type. So all of these have a kind of common interweaving factor of low vagal tone. Uh, cholestasis, also potentially insulin resistance. Um, and so this correlates with hypochlorhydria, decreased pepsin, decreased pancreatic enzymes, cholestasis or decreased bile, um, secretion and flow, possible gallstones. And again, the decreased vagal tone would additionally cause gastroparesis, hypomobility, potentially hiatal hernia. And I talked about already that cholinergic anti-inflammatory reflex with the spleen and how the lack of the vagal tone might actually um, uh, increase the incidence of food allergies. Uh, so having adequate vagal tone is important there. There is no real test for this. This is a clinical assessment based on history, based on uh, how the patient presents. And that might present with gas and bloating, undigested food in the stool, lots of diarrhea, constipation, again, potential food allergy or sensitivity, and maybe some degree of malabsorption, malnutrition from that. So the treatment um, for the functional excrement pancreatic insufficiency could be digestive enzymes, um, but really the enzymes are not, when you take enzymes, then the pancreas really doesn't need to function. What we, what we really need to do is we have a, an intact pancreas. What we need to do is stimulate the vagal activity so that we make more enzymes. And that would be with digestive stimulant bitters. These all increase vagal tone increased secretion of HCL, pepsin, pancreatic juice, uh, increased upper GI peristalsis. And that would be classic herbs like yellow gentian. Here you see that to the right here. This is an interesting alpine herb. Um, it likes the alpine heights. We can say that's really where the light forces are very intense. Um, and it sort of consolidates, brings these light forces together. And that's almost likened to sort of stimulating the inner light of digestion through the vagus nerve. So we can say it activates that vagal activity. We know that gentian too also increases the arterial blood flow uh, into the pancreas. So that also could assist in the stomach wall. So that could assist in the secretions. Um, garden uh, angelica, not angen angelica. Um, and uh, that's angelica, uh, archangelica. Blessed thistle, uh, nicus, Benedictus, um, and wormwood, uh, Attractylodes, which in Chinese medicine we use two different types, white and red. This would be more the white Attractylodes. Um, and then Hypericum. Now we usually think of that as an antidepressant herb, but this actually has a role as a digestive stimulant, especially in Eastern Europe and whatnot. This is used more for that. 
elecampane, more of a respiratory herb, but again, there's crossover between the respiratory and GI system. Uh, golden seal in small amounts, large amounts would kind of have the opposite effect. It can actually can damp down the vagus nerve. Bitter melon and potentially in very small amounts, nux vomica, which is used as a, in homeopathic dilutions only. Um, so that would be more the classic digestive stimulants. Notice a lot of these have yellow flowers. They say this is a yellow gesture, almost like shining yellow light on your abdomen. Um, the pungent stimulants, we say, have more of a red nature to them, and they more activate the circulation, the arterial blood flow. So ginger, pepper, clove, cardamom, galanga, cayenne, etc. And then cholagogs, choleretics, uh, increase the synthesis and the secretion of bile. So they support the bile process. And that would be uh, dandelion root, <coughs> um, the chelidonium, Bupleurum, Mahonia, organ grape, Chiononanthus, bitter orange, and Podophyllin, again, usually in homeopathic doses. Um, and then uh, supportive nutrients like iron, chromium, vanadium, they all support blood sugar, but also pancreatic function. Here, digestive enzymes, giving stomach acid, castor oil packs, uh, apple cider vinegar, D-limonene, these would all uh, be other adjunctive kind of agents that can be thought about. Same with N-acetylcysteine, that improves the bile-making process. And these are uh, choleretic factors. They make more bile, methionine, choline, and inositol. Um, so basically, this, these are all potential integrative treatments. Um, I tip, typically use uh, uh, combinations of these herbs in a low-dose tincture form. Uh, patients just put it in water, hold out in their tongue, and that is sensed and that activates the, the vagus receptors and they swallow that after a couple of seconds. Um, and the dose does not have to be very high, it doesn't have to be super bitter, um, but this can have a pretty profound effect at increasing those GI secretions. So this would be one pattern, the functional exocrine uh, pancreatic insufficiency. Now we could ask ourselves, could there be the opposite state? And I think certain patients do exhibit this, and this would be the functional, functional exocrine pancreatic excess. This would be more of a vagal excess pattern. And we usually think of vagus and the parasympathetics as being deficient, but you can have excess vagal phenomena. In fact, that's where a lot of irritable bowel syndrome, one of the treatments were less commonly used now, but used to be atropine, which blocks the parasympathetics. When you get motion sickness, that's an overactivation of the parasympathetics. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the old treatments for peptic ulcer was to sever the vagus nerve fibers going into the stomach to block acid secretion. <clears throat> so this would be a more of a fire picture. We'd say in the Chinese medicine language, spleen, stomach heat, or liver fire. Um, there's no corresponding biomedical uh, state per se, but we do see in the hot type of GERD, the type B gastritis and the duodenal ulcers would all be associated more with vagal overactivation. And that's gonna have hyperchlorhydria, increased pepsin, pancreatic enzymes, bile flow. In fact, many people with the sort of hot type GERD actually get bile reflux, not acid reflux. And, um, and that's, uh, that's actually thought to be more common than, than we thought. Just as a rough estimate, I would, I would sort of estimate that 70, maybe up to 80% of people have the cold type pattern with acid reflux, and then 20 to 30% have the hot type pattern. That's just purely from my own kind of clinical observations. So this would be increased vagal tone, uh, increased potential HPA access and hypercortisolism, um, maybe states of acute hepatitis in the liver, usually non-viral, and then uh, some forms of hypertension would all be correlated with this as well. Again, the assessment is clinical. There's no labs or specific for this, but from history, we might see all of the more burning symptoms. So everything made worse by heat, by pressure, by spicy, by acid, uh, and so forth. So you can read through more like bitter, uh, sour, belching, uh, that sort of thing. But even on the mental emotional level, more agitation, uh, agitation mania, restlessness, palpitation, insomnia. Uh, liver gallbladder symptoms might be more even up to jaundice, but bile reflux, right upper quadrant pain, uh, intense headaches, bloodshot eyes, even genital itching and redness. Uh, in Chinese medicine, of course, the liver channel actually goes through the inguinal canal, so uh, genital um, or uh, those kind of inguinal fungal infections and whatnot are often linked to problems along that channel. So what are the treatments for this? Well, herbally, the kind of gesture would be the opposite. So unlike the yellow stimulating, 
bitters. Here we want the blue sedating, cooling, anti-inflammatory bitters. And that would be what I'm calling digestive sedative bitters. So herbs like chamomile, which interestingly, we think of chamomile with white blossoms, yellow little flower heads. But if you distill the essential oil and let it oxidize, it becomes blue. We call it blue chamomile oil, and it's extremely anti-inflammatory. Uh, and lots of data looking at peptic ulcer and chamomile tea and things like that. Uh, in Chinese medicine, there's a form of gentian. Chinese gentian is blue gentian, which is shown here. It has blue flowers. So kind of an opposite gesture of the yellow gentian. Artichoke, uh, also more blue, purple flowers. Um, milk thistle, same thing. Uh, burdock, picro rhizas used in Tibetan uh, Ayurvedic Chinese medicine. More we ca we call a lot of these herbs cold. Uh, they have again anti-inflammatory, anti-heat effects. Feverfew, geranium, meadowsweet. Meadowsweet actually has interestingly salicylic acid, which you would think would be contraindicated in like a peptic ulcer or something. But uh, actually, studies have been done looking at meadowsweet tea for ulcers and finding that the flavonoids in there actually counteract any of the effects of the salicylates at, at worsening acid. Um, rumex, rhubarb in small doses, gardenia, marshmallow, slippery elm, aloe, these last three are demulcent, cooling demulcent herbs. Uh, some herbs have more of an antispasmodic, they block the uh, parasympathetic tone, and that would be your nightshades, belladonna, nicotania, uh, lobelia, not a nightshade, but it also has an anti-parasympathetic effect in Jamaican dogwood. Uh, and then supportive nutrients like copper, zinc, carnosine. Sulfur compounds often have an anti-inflammatory effect, like in the liver. And then L-glutamine, gamma orizonol, more demulcent. So these would be uh, herbs to treat those opposite, those heat patterns. So I just throw this in here as kind of suggestions to think clinically, maybe about things we can use outside, you know, of this simple, you know, let's, let's just suppress acid in everybody or, uh, you know, uh, along those lines. So let's look at uh, pancreatitis here first. So acute pancreatitis, the pancreatic juice actually enters the tissues of the pancreas, and once there, it triggers autodigestion of the gland, and that causes terrible pain. Often it can be fatal. Um, it's usually, though, reversible if a person survives the, the episode. Uh, the pancreas, despite that significant damage, actually can fully recover, kind of like the liver just regrows. There's not a lot of scar tissue or anything there, so it can regrow normally. Uh, there's different classifications going from mild to severe, uh, and the medical intervention will depend on the severity. Um, and there are different diagnostic scoring systems, which you can look up online, but the Ranson score, Glasgow score, Apache 2 score would be three examples of that based on clinical findings and some lab findings. Um, can kind of tell you the severity, but patients usually when they present, um, you can kind of just see if they're looking septic and things uh, that might tell you something else about the severity. Typically, patients will present with severe acute upper abdominal, usually epigastric pain, and the classic pain is deady, uh, is a dull, boring, steady pain. Not deady pain, steady pain, uh, usually sudden onset, and it radiates to the back with a lot of uh, abdominal tenderness, distension, uh, rebound tenderness, because that means the peritoneum now is, is involved. Usually there's nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite, fever, pretty typical, usually low grade, tachycardia, hypotension, mild uh, diarrhea, and jaundice. Um, now, if there is severe hemorrhage internally of the pancreas, uh, there can be vascular collapse and uh, shock. Um, and so that's why we want to really, uh, really be important about gauging the severity and determining uh, when medical intervention is needed. Um, the pancreatic infection actually is something that can happen in about half of patients after an episode of acute pancreatitis, they get an infection there, usually from commensal bowel flora. Um, and uh, this, uh, all of this can result in renal failure, in respiratory distress, obstructive jaundice, uh, temporary diabetes because the beta cells go offline, and hypocalcemia because interestingly, as the pancreas autodigests, the fat in the pancreas actually will precipitate calcium salts from plasma, and that can cause a rapid um, uh, drop in blood calcium. The differential diagnosis for acute pancreatitis will include things like acute cholecystitis, so gallbladder inflammation, usually from stones, 
um, an acute perforated duodenal ulcer, uh, acute intestinal obstruction, leaking aortic aneurysm, renal stones, pneumonia, MI, and acute mesenteric ischemia, usually from thrombosis of a mesenteric artery. So these would all be things, of course, to think about, but if in doubt, just refer uh, and, and usually call 911 to get immediate uh, attention for this patient. Um, the etiology, the most common risk factors for acute pancreatitis are two, and that's gallstones and chronic alcoholism. Now, others would be pancreatic infections. In fact, mumps um, causes uh, infection of the salivary glands, but also the pancreas. It also causes infection in, the, uh, in males in the testes. Uh, but this was a frequent cause when mumps infections were more common. Uh, trauma, uh, high blood lipids, especially triglycerides, usually over 500 milligrams per deciliter. Some sources say you have to get rid over a thousand, but when patients' triglycerides are over 500, we think they're at much higher risk for acute pancreatitis. Hypercalcemia, uh, different drugs, steroids, sulfonamides, azathioprine, an immunosuppressant, NSAIDs, and diuretics all increase the risk for acute pancreatitis. Uh, interestingly, some of the venom in snake and scorpion stings uh, can induce uh, acute pancreatitis. And then autoimmune disease like lupus is associated with acute pancreatitis, duodenal ulcers, and then many cases are idiopathic. There's no evidence of stones, no alcoholism, none of these other factors uh, come up in the history or on evaluation. Um, so the initial lesion is usually composed, it becomes edematous, there's a pocket of acute inflammation with congestion, and uh, these foci increase in size as the digestive enzymes are activated, they begin to auto-digest the pancreas, and that can become hemorrhagic, and then the pancreatic tissue becomes necrotic. So when it's in the acute hemorrhagic phase, this is a medical emergency because there can be severe bleeding and vascular collapse. Uh, pancreatic pseudocysts, so patients after they've gone through an episode of acute pancreatitis, uh, a wall of fibrous tissue forms around that area of inflammation, uh, leading behind what's called a pseudocyst. It, it doesn't have an epithelial lining, it's lined in um, collagen. And um, that typically, it can cause problems, but often that kind of indicates that the, in, the initial insult has been contained, and that's more the after effects. So that's a little bit on the pathogenesis of acute pancreatitis. So our assessment for acute pancreatitis will be history and physical exam. Our labs would might show on a CBC. Again, you're probably not going to stay, you know, order all these, wait for the results to come back. If you suspect, you know, any sort of life-threatening hemorrhage um, or any moderate to severe severity of the acute pancreatitis, this should be an immediate referral to the emergency department. But what they're going to do there is look at a CBC, see how elevated the white cells are, uh, check the liver. Uh, uh, function test, bilirubin, liver enzymes, ALKFAS, uh, check kidney function, BUN creatinine, check the electrolytes, especially for hypocalcemia. So any normal calcium levels are 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. When it gets under 7, a person's at a much higher risk for tetany. And uh, so that's a medical emergency to correct that. And then um, looking at blood glucose to make sure that they're not becoming um, a diabetic because of the destruction of the pancreas. And then looking at the cholesterol and triglyceride levels to see if that might be a precipitating factor. And then um, some of the classic markers of acute pancreatitis would be plasma amylase. The levels tend to rise and fall quickly, but they're usually three times above the normal level. Uh, and then what elevates and stays elevated longer would be the lipase. So we usually do both, but the lipase is a better long-term marker. And they usually, when we see lipase levels two and a half to three times that of the amylase, that's a pretty clear sign this is pancreatitis due to alcoholism. Um, C-reactive protein would just tell us about inflammation, but that's pretty easy to gauge usually. And then arterial blood gases, if we suspected any of the um, you know, signs of shock or whatnot. Um, our gold standard imaging would be abdominal ultrasound. Um, and that's going to look for the presence of gallstones, but that's going to tell us about kind of the extent of inflammation in the pancreas. Abdominal CT would give us a more clear kind of picture of the severity of that. Uh, plain fill, film x-ray standing lacks sensitivity, and abdominal MRI is usually not it's usually secondary to the CT scan. Um, so that's kind of the assessment.
The treatment um, is really, again, if you uh, expect a severe acute pancreatitis, this patient should be referred. That's a level four on the therapeutic order, um, referred for treatment. There are different guidelines from the American College of Gastroenterology, American Gastroenterology Association, et cetera, and really they recommend the treatment should depend on severity. So for mild cases, we do supportive care, usually only, and severe would be intensive care. So general guidelines would be fluids, pain control, bowel rest, so that means nil per os, nothing by mouth at first, and then um, usually uh, feeding, um, enter enteral feeding for that first 48 hours, and then after that, stimulating normal, we actually need normal digestion uh, for it to properly heal. Uh, antibiotics usually are not indicated unless there's some signs of infection, a, an ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangeal pancreatography, can actually go up the bile ducts, so that's an endoscope, it goes up the, it, through the ampulla vater, goes up the bile ducts and can actually pull out any stones, especially stones blocking the ampulla. It's a very common region, remember in the pancreas, um, if here's the duodenum, we have the pancreatic duct, the liver bile ducts come together at the same point here, and gallstones coming down here, a common place they can get stuck is right here. And so that can cause blockage and backup of all the pancreatic juice and then you initiate uh, pancreatitis. Um, surgery for you know removing gallstones, et cetera, cholecystectomy, and then monitoring for shock, uh, lung and uh, renal failure, any GI bleeds as well. The overall mortality rate uh, for uh, pa acute pancreatitis is about 10 to 15%. It's going to be less with any uh, biliary pancreatitis, in other words, due to the gallstones, and then type 2 diabetes that increases risk and uh, decreases uh, outcomes. Uh, and then death usually occurs within a week from multiple organ failure in those who succumb to this. Uh, and then um, infection usually after a week is what uh, can be most significant. So the complications, just so you know about those, would be systemic, again, acute respiratory distress syndrome, disseminated intravascular coagulation, all of the blood begins to clot in the vessels, and then it uses up all your clotting proteins and then you bleed everywhere. Uh, Multi-organ failure, hypocalcemia we've talked about, severe uh, type 1 diabetes and hyperglycemia, and malabsorption from lack of the enzymes. Uh, the pancreatic pseudocyst, again, this is a collection of the pancreatic fluid walled off by granulation tissue, develops in four to six weeks. Often those will uh, regress, but sometimes they need more surgical or drainage, um, and so that'll depend on the size and where it's at. Uh, pancreatic abscess would be a pocket of an infection. Splenic artery aneurysms uh, or thrombosis, blood clots. Duodenal or common bile duct obstruction from all the inflammation and then progression to acute pancreatitis, and we'll, uh, sorry, chronic pancreatitis, which we'll look at next. So that's kind of like a pancreatitis that didn't quite heal and, or whatever the insulting injury is keeps triggering it. And unfortunately, the outcomes for chronic pancreatitis are not so good either. So that's, a, that's it for acute pancreatitis. Gives you a little idea about maybe what to look for and what the typical workups and uh, treatments are. <clears throat> So with chronic pancreatitis, this is long-standing inflammation of the pancreas. Uh, there's almost like little episodes of acute pancreatitis that heal and then recur. Um, so we get mild to moderate acute pancreatitis kind of recurring. Uh, unfortunately, what happens with all that inflammation chronically is we develop the hallmark of chronic inflammation, which is scar tissue or fibrosis. Um, again, alcoholism and gallstones are at the top of our list here. But here we also see autoimmune diseases like the uh, lupus, tumors, uh, not commonly, there are some genetic predispositions to this, cystic fibrosis, and then again, many patients are idiopathic. Um, we don't know what the cause is. Uh, the pathophysiology, the pancreas becomes obliterated by dense scar tissue. The ducts become dilated. There's calcification in the pancreas. In fact, on a plain film x-ray, the pancreas will light up because we can actually see all the calcium deposits in there. And remember, calcium is radio opaque, so that'll show as a bright white spot on the x-ray film. Uh, and then there's going to be destructions of islets of Langerhans leading to type 1 diabetes. So here, it's not going to be as severe usually as the um, acute, but it's going to be long-standing, maybe uh, episodes of, of increasing severity with improvement. 
So upper abdominal pain usually worse after eating or drinking. Better fasting or leaning forward, that kind of takes the pressure from the peritoneum off the pancreas. Uh, and it could be asymptomatic in some, but the pancreas continues to undergo this fibrotic destruction. Uh, but the classic would be long-term malabsorption steatorrhea, that's from poor bile flow and then subsequent fat malabsorption, uh, malabsorption of fat-soluble vitamins, the A, D, E, and K, uh, weight loss, which can be dramatic, and then um, diabetes, the type 1 diabetes, and that would put a person at risk of diabetic ketoacidosis, which we'll talk about in the diabetes section. Uh, the assessment here would be, again, maybe measuring amylase and lipase, but they probably won't be as elevated as in the acute case because of the extensive destruction of the gland. Uh, there's something called the secretin stimulation test. That's the gold standard, actually. Um, unfortunately, it's not used that much clinically. Usually, this is under the care of an endocrinologist or a gastroenterologist. They could do this test. Um, and it tests for the level of bicarbonate secretion from the pancreas after they're given, injected with secretin. Remember, secretin is the uh, hormone from the duodenum that, that uh, tells the pancreas to secrete its juice. Um, and that look at liver function tests and then any serological testing to rule out autoimmune disease. This would be all part of the typical assessment for chronic pancreatitis. Imaging, again, are um, CT, abdominal ultrasound, MRI. Usually CT, ultrasound would be our two main techniques there. And then the ERCP, again, gold standard diagnosis. Um, we can put the scope up the, uh, the pancreatic duct and see the extensive scarring. Uh, and then calcium deposits might be seen with the x-ray. And then a pancreatic biopsy can be done as well. And often that's done from the ERCP. Okay, so the treatment here medically would be avoiding risk factors, alcohol cessation, more low-fat diets to reduce the triglycerides if that's an issue, smoking cessation, um, analgesics, sometimes even opioids are given chronically, uh, pancreatic enzymes are often supplemented, and then uh, diabetes is addressed if, uh, through insulin therapy if necessary. There is uh, therapeutic endoscopy where the uh, endoscope can go in and open up the opening, the ampullovator, if that's scarred shut, if uh, need, that needs to be dilated open. And then surgery to potentially address any pseudocysts, fistulas, abscesses, ascites, etc. Um, the overall survival is 70% at 10 years, 45% at 20 years uh, for chronic pancreatitis. So this unfortunate destruction over long term, if it's not addressed, can lead to that. And there's an increased risk of developing pancreatic adenocarcinoma at about 4% at 20 years. So the most common complications will be the malabsorption, type 1 diabetes, pancreatic pseudocysts, which may be large enough to create issues, uh, mechanical obstruction of the bile duct or the duodenum, uh, pancreatic ascites with pleural effusion, and then um, the thromboses in the splenic vein leading to the liver. So um, those would all be things to keep in mind with chronic pancreatitis. Uh, with both acute chronic pancreatitis, um, you know, we can think about some of the herbal therapies I already discussed in terms of the functional uh, deficient and ex excess uh, exocrine states. So the stimulant or the sedative bitters, those would be potential therapies to be used adjunctively. Um, and so especially with the chronic pancreatitis, it might be worth a shot to use those herbs. Um, I've often found that patients with chronic pancreatitis do respond to some of those stimulant bitters to some degree, but depends on the uh, amount of destruction they've had in their pancreas as to whether or not they regain any function there. So that's it for acute and chronic pancreatitis. Next, I want to talk about pancreatic cancer. Um, in 2010, there were over 43,000 cases in the US. Um, and uh, again, most of what we think about with pancreatic cancer are the adenocarcinomas. That's over 95%. Um, and these have a very poor prognosis. So the statistics here are for adenocarcinoma. Um, so less than 5% are alive five years after diagnosis um, with the adenocarcinoma. Almost 50% of patients die within six weeks of diagnosis, and about 10% live one year, and only 1% survive the five years there. Um, so that is a, um, you know, these are not uh, good statistics. Again, this is the average. We, of course, have individual patient outliers, which we want to always encourage. 
Um, we want to try to do everything we can to help our patients. But a lot of the care for pancreatic adenocarcinomas usually is more palliative because by the time the tumors are diagnosed, they've already metastasized significantly because unfortunately there aren't a lot of real characteristic warning signs of early stage pancreatic uh, cancer. And that's why we call this the silent killer. Um, it's often asymptomatic. Um, and we start to see the symptoms only when the tumors become larger. And again, by that time, they've already spread in many cases. So that would be the typical upper abdominal pain or back pain um, that occurs in 80 to 85% of people with metastatic disease. Jaundice, uh, so most of the adenocarcinomas arise in the head of the pancreas, and that would block the common bile duct. And so there's a classic sign, Corvoisier sign, that is jaundice with a painlessly distended gallbladder. So you can actually palpate the gallbladder. It feels distended under the liver margin on the right upper quadrant. Um, and they have jaundice as well. That's, that's a classic sort of finding of more advanced pancreatic cancer. Uh, unexplained weight loss uh, should always be worked up, uh, obviously to rule out uh, malignancy of any kind, but that would be you know, one of the cancer warning signs here. Uh, any sign of malabsorption, so steatorrhea, diarrhea, those would be, uh, you know, potential problems of from the exocrine enzyme insufficiency. Um, Trousseau sign, which is thrombophlebitis. So people, because of the cancer, the inflammatory state that that creates, it tends to make the blood clot more easily, and that increases the risk of thrombi forming, especially in the venous system. And that causes uh, blockage of veins and then subsequent inflammation. That's thrombophlebitis. And then depression, diabetes from the destruction of the beta cells, pulmonary embolism, again, because of that increased thrombotic state. All of these would be uh, potential, potentially associated with uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, especially the adenocarcinomas. Now, the adenocarcinomas arise from the pancreatic ducts. Uh, the endocrine tumors, again, less than five, really rare, in fact, less than 2% of cases arise from the islet cells, and they have a better prognosis because there's a little bit more treatment options for them. Um, the risk factors, again, we'll, I'll give this for the adenocarcinoma, is family history, so genetics, age, the risk increases with age. Uh, most cases of pancreatic adenocarcinoma occur over 60. Uh, diets, we think a Western type diet, low in vegetables, fiber, high in processed foods, meats, salts, uh, saturated fat, high fructose corn syrup drinks, all that seems to be associated with increased risk. Uh, alcohol, the association here is weak, unlike the pancreatitis. Uh, chronic pancreatitis is often linked, but it might not be causal. But again, that is one concern we have of chronic pancreatitis is the uptick of liver of pancreatic cancer risk. Obesity, type 2 diabetes. H. pylori has been kind of implicated as a potential agent here. That's a bacteria that lives, of course, in the acidic conditions of the stomach. We associate that with um, peptic ulcer, stomach cancer, and some are now potentially connecting it here with uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, again, the challenge of this is, is it causal or is it just uh, commensal? You know, is it really just there because of the uh, decreased immunity and whatnot that occurs and then the, the body can't keep it at bay? Periodontal disease from different bacteria and then potential nutrient deficiencies, but those are probably not causes of pancreatic cancer. They might just be correlates. Uh, the tumors appear in adenocarcinoma dense, scar-filled. Usually, again, they're in the head of the pancreas, uh, and they can block that common bile duct that causes the Corvoisier sign. Uh, tumors in the tail and the body usually grow quite large, and they've usually metastasized to the liver and the lymph nodes before they're detected. Um, so, again, uh, fairly asymptomatic until later stages. There are no screening tests for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Um, I'm going to focus on that here. We'll talk about the neuroendocrine tumors here in just a moment. Um, but, uh, but basically, we're going to look for, obviously, in any of our patients, any of the classic signs and symptoms. Uh, there are no specific lab tests either for pancreatic cancer. Liver function tests might be uh, uh, changed because of bile duct uh, blockage, especially ALKFOS and GGT and bilirubin. Uh, CA199 is a tumor marker associated with pancreatic cancer. It lacks any sort of sensitivity or specificity, but it might be helpful for once it's diagnosed to track the progress of the cancer for different types. 
of, of cancers. We're finding even within pancreatic adenocarcinoma, there are many subtypes depending on which proteins are expressed on the cells and so forth. Uh, CT is used uh, for imaging to stage the cancer. Uh, and then uh, the endoscopic ultrasound might also be helpful for uh, developing you know, kind of an image of where the tumors are and so forth. So in this picture, here's a CT. Um, we can kind of see, I'll do it in red here. Here's the pancreas here. This is the head of the pancreas. And notice the very large tumor growing right here. So that would be probably the classic appearance of an adenocarcinoma. Um, there is also an endoscopic needle biopsy, and uh, that would be guided by the endoscopic ultrasound, and that would establish the diagnosis definitively. Um, so the treatment for the adenocarcinoma um, would be, uh, again, largely palliative by the time they're diagnosed. So um, surgery, um, would be, depends on the stage of the cancer, but there is actually a procedure called the Whipple procedure, um, and that's gonna be used for pancreatic head tumors, but that requires removal of the gallbladder, um, requires removal of a lot of the intestine, part of the stomach. It's a major um, procedure that's done there. Um, and uh, so that's gonna be applicable to maybe 20% or so uh, with localized disease, especially if it's caught early enough. Um, sometimes the, tum the surgery is used to resect the tumor, to debulk it. Unfortunately, we find with a lot of tumors, if you just do that, um, if it's already metastasized, those satellite tumors now just suddenly start to grow more quickly. And so it actually accelerates the cancer. So it's almost like that primary tumor puts out a signal to tell the other tumors not to grow as fast, not to use up all the nutrition. You take out that primary tumor and now all those secondary tumors explode in their activity. Um, radiation can be considered in some cases, and then chemo, again, usually palliative. Again, we're seeing uh, an increase of immunotherapies, targeted immunotherapies to different cancers. I don't know of any studies with pancreatic cancer at this point, but that might be something uh, that we see down the road as well. From the um, uh, traditions like anthroposophic medicine, again, using traditions like stimulating the immune forces through fever and inflammation, uh, using, for example, injectable mistletoe extracts. That's called Iscador, uh, Iscador therapy. I have heard that used for uh, at least palliative care for some patients with advanced uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. The idea there is you're really trying to stimulate the immune system to attack the tumor. So encouraging warmth, encouraging any of those therapies that increase circulation and immune activity uh, could be uh, part of that as well. Um, I'll talk about the endocrine pancreatic cancers here. That's going to depend on which type of, uh, I'll talk about that next, but that'll depend on which type of cancers uh, we're talking about. So that's a little on pancreatic uh, adenocarcinomas. Finally, I'll say a few words about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Again, these are less than 2% of all pancreatic cancers. These arise from the islet cells. They go by various names, PNETs, PETs, pancreatic endocrine tumors. Um, and uh, only um, uh, the majority, fortunately, are benign. They're actually not malignant. Some of them can be malignant, though, and that would be what we call islet cell carcinoma. 40% uh, of the PANNETs have symptoms related to excess hormone secretion, so they become functional. Now, the other 60% are non-functional, and so there's no excess or deficiencies in the hormones. Um, they can, unfortunately, some of the non-functional ones can secrete other peptides, and those can be measured to kind of track the progress. But the symptoms here are going to be very vague. They're really going to depend on which hormone is over-secreted, but the kind of general symptoms like abdominal pain, diarrhea, indigestion would be maybe classic for most of them. Potentially jaundice with, from any obstruction of the biliary ducts would result from that. So probably the most common of these would be the insulinoma, and that's derived from the beta cells, hypersecretes insulin. And so we actually get here hypoglycemia is our primary uh, clinical manifestation. And uh, you can use something called Whipple's triad, which is signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Um, that, and having a plasma glucose under 45 in adults. And that it reverses with the intake of glucose. So those three, if they're met, we, create, we meet the criteria for Whipple's triad. And um, we see in these cases high insulin, high pro-insulin, high C-peptide. 
Imaging with ultrasound or CT, more likely, or even MRI, might show the individual, the, the tumor itself in the pancreas. And then angiography, that's where you feed the contrast agent into the splenic artery, and it basically, uh, we can then capture with um, uh, you know, radiology, we can capture the image of any tumors uh, that are inside the pancreas. Um, usually these are about one to four per million uh, a year, uh, but it's the most common of all the pan nets. Um, usually the tumors are less than two centimeters. And again, our classic symptoms of hypoglycemia are gonna be the most prevalent. So patients with unexplained hypoglycemia be something to kind of look into, especially if they had uh, hyperinsulinemia, high insulin here. Um, the, one of the classic things we see with hypoglycemia is an increase in your catecholamines, your stress hormones. So what happens is your sympathetic nervous system fires in order to stimulate glucose uh, synthesis via gluconeogenesis. And uh, we also get uh, high levels of uh, the uh, glucagon being secreted as well to try to increase your um, blood sugar levels. Uh, most of these are benign, except for, of course, the symptoms if they're functional. Uh, a minority, though, five to even up to 30% might actually metastasize and become set up elsewhere in the body. Uh, less than 1% of these arise outside the pancreas in ectopic pancreatic tissue, and 5% are associated with the genetic condition, uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1, MEN1, so patients with that would be at higher risk. Um, surgery might be an option. Um, unfortunately, almost uh, two-thirds will develop diabetes after the surgery, and uh, there are different medications, in particular somatostatin. Remember, that inhibits the beta cell secretion, so that could be used uh, as treatment. And then there are different uh, chemo regimens, uh, doxyrubicin with streptozocin and fluorouracil with streptozocin might be used as well. So that's an insulinoma. The opposite would be a glucagonoma, uh, even less common, but that would be a tumor of the alpha cells with increased glucagon. And that has what's called glucagonoma syndrome, which is increased blood sugar. Um, so diabetes in up to 90% of cases. Uh, decrease serum amino acids, decrease essential fatty acids because the glucagon converts, um, it stimulates basically the gluconeogenesis, so it's going to convert the breakdown of fatty acids, triglycerides, uh, into uh, glucose, and then um, anemia, diarrhea, weight loss. There's also a skin condition called necrolytic migratory erythemia, NME, um, and we get these erythematous blisters and swelling across areas that are subject to greater friction and pressure, like in the lower abdomen, buttocks, perineum, and groin. And it's probably due to decreased essential fatty acids in the skin. Um, so that's gonna be in more of a late stage uh, presentation. So the glucagon, serum glucagon is often over 1,000 picograms per milliliter. Normal ranges are between 50 and 200. Low amino acids, zinc, essential fatty acids, anemia, um, and then uh, our imaging Technique, CT, MRI, etc., might all be used to do the assessment there. Uh, somatostatin, uh, and I should mention that octreotide is a somatostatin analog, and then uh, chemo, again, different regimens, and then potentially surgical resection. So that's the two most common pan nets would be insulinoma and glucagonoma. And just to kind of complete the list, talk about just a few of these even less common. Um, peanuts, and that would be a gastrinoma, we already talked about, a tumor that oversecretes gastrin, usually in the pancreas or duodenum, and, um, but uh, in the hypersecretion of gastrin would result in hypersecretion of acid into the duodenum, and so we get a uh, peptic increased uh, duodenal ulcer from that. Um, you can also see increased stomach ulcers. Uh, so there'd be increased peristalsis. This inhibits the lipase because the acid in the duodenum will neutralize the pancreatic enzymes, so they can't work appropriately. So we get severe diarrhea and malabsorption. And uh, frequently this is associated with, of course, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Um, and uh, if the gastronomas are found in the pancreas, they actually have a greater chance for malignancy. So here we do a fasting serum gastrin test a secretin stimulation test to check for the pancreatic activity, and a somatostatin a scintigraphy. Uh, this is another test that we can uh, use to assess gastronomas.
So usually it's treated with, if it's surgically resectable, remove the tumor. If not, or for just symptom relief, proton pump inhibitors are given for that. A VIPoma is excessive phasoactive intestinal peptide, very rare, uh, one per 10 million a year, but this has profound watery diarrhea with uh, hypokalemia. We call that pancreatic cholera syndrome um, that can result in acidosis, vasodilation, hypercalcemia, hyperglycemia. This one also could be associated with a multiple endocrine neoplasia type one. And usually tumors, by the time these symptoms appear, have already spread in over half of patients. Um, so the assessment would involve looking at the VIP levels, again, imaging of the pancreas, and then correcting dehydration, uh, diarrhea, uh, surgery to remove tumors. And then uh, there are specific radionucleotide therapies used for uh, metastatic disease. And the last one would be the somatostatinoma. Um, and that's going to be tumor of the delta cells secreting extra somatostatin. And again, that's going to inhibit all of your pancreatic hormones. So that can cause uh, diabetes. Um, that can cause achlorhydria, uh, gallstones from inhibition of the CCK, which normally stimulates your bile flow and gallbladder contractions, and diarrhea. Uh, and then others I won't talk about would be ACTH omas, CRH omas. Uh, a lot of these actually come from. Um, are the same as the pituitary cells, but they can actually occur in the pancreas. Uh, growth uh, hormone omas and PTRHRP, which, which uh, mimics parathyroid hormone, that's going to also increase serum calcium. Um, so these, I just put this on here just uh, to complete the list. Again, very uncommon, and they would need workup for those individual hormones to assess that. Um, so that completes it for pancreatic disorders. Um, again, there's going to be a whole other section on diabetes and the approach there, so we'll look more closely at the insulin disorders uh, with that.